the Vicky Ramo Show, and today we're at Takugama Wildlife Sanctuary, home of Sierra Leone's chimpanzees at Regents. It is 6.30 in the morning. The birds are awake, the chimps are awake, I'm awake, and we are about to go on adventure. Follow me. I need some coffee. There's coffee over there. Had it not been for a man named Bala Amara Sekaran, Takugama might not exist. The story goes that 20 years ago, Bala and his wife were visiting Sierra Leone for the first time when they came across a chimpanzee who had been kept as a pet that wasn't doing so good. They took the chimpanzee, nursed it back to health, and they realized that chimps like Bruno didn't have a home, they didn't have a place to stay. So he committed to setting up a space where chimps and other animals could live and learn to be like animals. <laughs> um, today Takugama has 77 chimpanzees that are home here and what generally happens is they rescue chimps from homes and from around the neighborhoods and also from as far away as Gola Forest. They bring them here and most times the chimps don't know how to be chimps because if you've grown up domesticated in someone's house you may not know you know how to be in the wild. They teach them how to be in the wild. They give them health care and they make sure that they're good and healthy and they can live one with nature as it was meant to be. So we're gonna visit with the chimps. I'm gonna get in there and give, you know, these hands, get them dirty and um, work with the chimps. We're gonna visit all the other facilities that they have. And we're just gonna show you why this is probably one of the best places in Sierra Leone to experience nature, to understand the importance of ecotourism, and to know why conservation is important, not just for animals, but also for human beings. Okay, we can go. Okay. All right. Come back so we can shoot other stuff. The name is, these are birds that are actually found in Sierra Leone, um, Guinea, and Liberia, and Ivory Coast. These are the endemic species of uh, Guinea forests. So we have most of them here. But then it's difficult to come by. Now you can see it's a bit quiet and uh, you can hear calls from far away. But as time goes on, as you go along the route, then we'll be able to maybe see a few of these species. But then the forest, Guinea forest endemics actually, uh, like Fanti Wings and then the Sharp Spallies. This should be etc. etc. So we have the Guinea forest endemics and then the western endemics. Yeah. So they are actually, most of which are found within this forest. Mm -hmm. That means this forest is rich in bird species. Nice. Maybe most of the birds actually we don't see with our naked eyes. I always refer you to the book I have, Western Nekato. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's quite one of the biggest bubbles among the others. So it's in fact much more colorful than most of the other uh, bubbles around here. Mm -hmm. So that's the one that's making that's it's making the that sound. Yeah. The black color. Yeah, that's right. 
paradise by country. Mm -hmm. Red belly. So I've just finished the Takugama bird and breakfast walk. We saw bulbuls, flycatchers, and one that I actually remember, the western wicketer. I was really amazed that our bird guide knows all the different calls. I don't even know one! <laughs> See? <laughs> Nothing. So now I'm going to talk to him about his job as a bird guide, and then he's going to teach me how to call like a bird. <laughs> So Mr. Willie here took us on a bird walk this morning and um, you heard him actually, I'm sure you did, talking to the birds and calling out to them. So I wanted to ask you yeah. how you got into birding. Yeah, as uh, recently as four years back, um, there was a guy who called Kenneth who came around called by Mr. Bella to say there's a potential here for bird species. He knows that he knows very well about birds, so he called him and then brought him here and uh, talked to him. He says, Willie and one other guy, why can't you join this man to make sure you go about doing some birding and mm -hmm. he teach you? Yes, that was the time he came. But then it's like he was just coming in to polish my own ideas because I did my sort of uh, wildlife training in Tanzania. Okay. Um, ontology was part of the Soviet area, mm -hmm. so it's like didn't take me long for me to understand exactly what that means. Okay, how many bird species do we have in this area, or in Freetown, or in Sierra Leone? Well, <clears throat> I can tell you more about about this area because I haven't gone to the length and breadth of this country to okay. actually survey. But according to our statistics here in Taugama, it's like uh, over 100 species of birds that have been identified in this particular area location. Wow. Yeah. And how often do you see them around? Every second, every minute you move about, you make sure you come across one or two or three species. Mm -hmm. That's definite. You must come across birds moving within the forest. So today you gave us this, yeah. which is the bird identification guide. Yeah. And we, well, the part that I remember is that we saw bulbuls, monarchs, and... What's the other name, sir? Flycatchers? Or am I making red, red, that up? Red-bellied flycatcher. Yes, we did see flycatchers. So, mm. I, I heard you making different sounds for each bird. So, I'm going to quiz you. <laughs> How does a western wicketer sound? Western nekato. Oh, it's a nekater. Yeah, this I'll one is wicketer. Oh, it's spelled wrongly then. Oh, it's spelled wrongly. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. How do you make the western nekater sound? Um, western nekato you know it's actually from the bubble family and okay. it's one of the biggest of the bubbles okay and it's very colorful actually different from other the bu other bubbles mm -hmm. but then it makes some guttural sounds okay yeah how does a red-bellied paradise flycatcher sound red-bellied paradise flycatcher sounds Just like that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna have to practice when I go home. And another one that we saw was there's another one. Can I help you? Yes, please help me. Okay, well, I don't remember which other one we saw, but can you tell me what sound the pied crow makes? That's a hot mental, as we say in Sierra Leone. Pied crow is, uh, we call it minister bird. Okay. Is that in the black and white one? Exactly. Looks like it's wearing a suit? Ex exactly. Ah, yeah. I know about birds. <laughs> exactly. It actually calls like this. <laughs> If you are laughing, then we are going to continue with this. <laughs> Wait. Wah, 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 wah. See? Bird talk. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
what's the one thing you want people in Sierra Leone to know about birds? Yeah, there are quite a lot of things actually I want people to know about birds because okay. people think birds are just another thing. Mm -hmm. They are all part of the forest. Okay. They, in fact, they make um, 80% of the forest ecosystem. Okay. But not only forest ecosystem, but also in the other savanna woodlands, savanna areas, there are a lot of bird species, despite those ones on the island, sort mm -hmm. of. So, birds are very important. They are indicators of habitat destruction. Okay. They tell you that that habitat is being destroyed. Oh, okay. Because from the forest, you have destroyed the forest, you now find the forest birds in the savanna, sorry, in the woodland, oh. in areas where it is bushland, we call it. So that's how it is. Okay. Because we tell you exactly that habitat is completely destroyed because they are moving from their uh, usual habitat to habitat where they are not used to. I'm tired, which means I'm ready for breakfast. Wow. So I'm gonna cut to the bottom. This is. <laughs> 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 Heart palpitation. So we finished the bird walk, and of course, it's my favorite time of the day. This is akara. Akara is made from rice and bananas. It's like rice and banana fritters. Really good. Word of caution. You don't want to keep an adult chimp as a pet. Do you know why? An angry chimp is as strong as five men. So you don't want to keep one as a pet. You no go able. So I'm here with Izzy, who is a vet at Takugama Chimp Sanctuary, and he's gonna tell me what he does here. So Izzy, tell me, why should people not keep chimps as pets? So there's a few reasons for that. Um, the first one would be that they might get them when they're small and cute, and everybody wants to hold this chimp, but by the time they reach adolescence, they become uh, extremely difficult to handle, and as adults, they're extremely dangerous animals. They're wild animals, they're not domesticated. So what often might happen in that situation is the person might keep them in a cage or try and send them somewhere else and they have you know, a worse life because of that. The other big risk is a health risk. Um, so because we're so genetically close to chimpanzees, we can share a lot of the same diseases, things like tuberculosis, uh, other respiratory viruses, other uh, gastrointestinal parasites, um, which can all be detrimental to our health and also fatal. Um, and then the other reason is that it's very damaging for a chimp's psychological well-being. So there's been a lot of um, studies to show that chimps need to be raised by chimps and when they're raised in human environments it's very difficult for them to readapt as chimps. Um, and the psychological uh, re rehabilitation is one of the biggest challenges we have in sanctuary life. Um, what goes into the normal chimp diet that you have here? What do chimps eat and how often do they eat and why or how is their diet different from what local Syrians might eat? Mm -hmm. So they, they eat quite a balanced diet. Uh, in the wild normally it's primarily fruits but they are omnivores so they do eat some insects and occasionally they might hunt um, other monkeys or squirrels or you know, other small, small mammals. Um, here in the sanctuary we provide them with seasonal fruit and then we supplement them as well. Um, so normally they get fed four to five times a day um, with a variety of different fruits and potatoes. And then we also offer them, um, which they will have just witnessed, the bulgur ball, which is a high protein um, ball to basically provide all the nutrients that meat would, for example. Um, just to supplement the diet and then uh, oftentimes they might get vitamins or like uh, kids uh, preparations like meal replacements and stuff like that just to help balance things out a little bit. So. Okay, I saw that you had like small kind of toddler chimps and then millennial mm -hmm. chimps and then <laughs> old and mature chimps. Do their like diets vary depending on the age of the chimp? Yeah, definitely. 
So a uh, chimp normally stays with its mother for four to five years, um, completely dependent on the mother. Um, so they'll be breastfeeding that entire time. So it's a much longer... Five years yeah. of breastfeeding? <laughs> So it's a, it's a much longer period than humans are used to, obviously. So um, we do provide them with milk during that age range um, or milk supplements. And as they age from about, you know, the age of one or so, they might start taking solid food. Um, so they're still getting milk, but they're also getting fruits and other solid foods um, with that. And then by the time they reach four to five years old, they might move from the baby group into the millennials group or, or what have you. Uh, and in that case, uh, we'll stop the milk and just provide them with the, the normal diet. But it's based on size and, and uh, weight category as well. So we ration what the different age groups get, but they all get the same or similar diet. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit about how chimps live usually we've seen that we you, you have like groups of like up to 10 and i think up to 12 and you were mentioning that um you have like the females and then the alpha males can you talk a little bit about the i guess the group dynamic yeah. how um, their families are structured yeah so uh, a little bit different than what we're used to as a nuclear family uh I, it's actually more like the African extended family system but oftentimes you might have up to 30 or even 40 individuals in one group um, and there's a variety of females and males but usually you'll have a dominant male called the alpha male and he will have a female that is highest ranking and some other females that are also high ranking and then the rest of the group kind of falls into place underneath that in terms of rank but they definitely have a social hierarchy right. um, and they know who to ally with if they want to get something done so and there's also something we call fission fusion dynamics so groups are always splitting and rejoining so individual members might go off and find a different group and somebody else might come and join their group um, so there's a lot of you know movement amongst the wild chimps I know that right now you have about 77 chimps What's the maximum capacity here and also what's the ultimate goal? I mean, you rescue the chimps, they come here. Is the goal to get them back into the wild? Do you, is the goal to just keep them in the sanctuary? What's the goal of bringing, the ultimate goal of bringing them here? So we usually are around 80 chimpanzees at the sanctuary and I would say that's close to our capacity. Um, the reason for a sanctuary's existence is law enforcement because if you have a problem and you are addressing the problem with confiscating these chimps, they need somewhere to go and if there's nowhere to go, there's no solution. Um, the ultimate goal is obviously reintroduction into the wild and that's the dream that you know these confiscated animals will be able to be rehabilitated and eventually live like wild chimps and contribute to the genetic um, diversity of that wild endangered population. Um, the practicality is very challenging to do that, um, so we are always aiming for that. But right now, the chimps that we have have not been released, but they have large natural forest enclosures that mimic the wild environment. Um, so we try and we have five different stages that they go through from when they come in and they're extremely dependent on humans to provide them care mm -hmm. and then slowly we get them more into chimp life, more into their groups, more independent and now as you'll see in the forest groups they go out in the day, they're out there the entire day on their own, they're even feeding from the natural fruit trees in the enclosures um, and then they come in at night to sleep. So. My last question for you is, you know, we can hear the chimps right now. Is there such a thing as like chimp language? And if there is, have you mastered it? Can we learn some chimp tongues so that if I ever find myself in a situation, I can, you know, do the Harry Potter. You know, Harry Potter used to speak to snakes. I could do like, yo, I've got this. It's very possible. Uh, yeah, so possible. It, are there like some sounds that are meant to communicate certain things? I'm sure there is, but have you mastered it? Because, you know, you're here and you're working with them, so... Well, I wouldn't say mastered it, okay. but um, at a conversational level. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we actually have a board of a lot of chimp vocalizations and their meanings, so I can take you down there and, and okay. show you. But okay, fantastic. Yes, no, definitely they have a language uh, of their own, and, uh, you know, they're not able physically to make the sounds that 
create human language. Mm -hmm. um, so I think they have the capacity to to do that, and they definitely understand human language. Um, but yes, we as sanctuary workers and caregivers, we all work really hard to understand their language so that when they're trying to tell us something or when there's an issue in the group, we know what the issue is just by listening and observing. Um, so I can give you some demonstration okay. of uh, a pant hoot, which is uh, basically a greeting mm -hmm. um, when a chimp is in the forest and they're calling to the others to say, come and feed, or, like, just, to say, yeah, or just to say, hey, I'm here. <laughs> they make this sound. Okay, so it goes. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna and try. And then you'll get a response. So now oh, it's, that was... <laughs> it's, it's your turn to do the response. Okay, okay. <laughs> what you just did was. <laughs> Perfect. <Yay! laughs> so, hello to you back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And if you see a like, what about the alpha males? Like, if they see a very cute, you know, female, is there like a different one for like, hey babe, or is just a general? Well, they might come and be very excited. When they're okay. excited, they have this sound. It goes like. <laughs> All right. I think I've, like I think I've heard. Or, I think yeah. I've heard that one. Yeah. Some of the guys in Freetown <laughs> might have that same one. So it's their way of cat calling. <laughs> yeah. So that was Dr. Izzy here at the Takugama Chimp Sanctuary, and he's just taught us chimp talk and health <laughs> life. We'll be right back. So I'm here at Takugama Wildlife Sanctuary, home of Sierra Leone's chimps, and um, I'm having dinner, as you can see. On the menu today is fried rice, fried plantains, fried fish, curry, and vegetables because you have to keep it balanced. So if you came to stay here, either for one or for two, <laughs> you could be having dinner here right now. There's also a fireplace, which I hear is quite romantic if you're into that kind of thing. Clearly not, because I'm professional. Pretty good! I'm here with Aram, who is a program manager at the Takugama Chimp Sanctuary in Regent. He's in charge of strategies, planning, and programs. So Aram, tell me, how long have you been with Takugama? So I came here in May of last year, meaning 2017. So for me, it was a big change in terms of um, taking on this role. I had never, prob never been to Africa previously. Okay. And I came from the private sector as well, working on economic development projects. So this was new and exciting for myself. And at the same time, it gave me um, a chance and an opportunity to finally channel my true passion, which is contributing to ecotourism and making sure that that's linked to conservation and environmental protection. So it finally gave me a chance to put everything that I've uh, learned from the, the business side into helping grow the ecotourism program. Okay. When did Takugama transition from just a sanctuary for, for mm. chimps to now being a destination for both local and international tourists looking mm -hmm. to have a more natural ecotourist experience? Very good. So, when the, when the sanctuary was founded back in 1995, the whole premise of that foundation was to initially protect the chimps. Mm -hmm. And then once, of course, through the progression of time, once the welfare was taken care of, and once the true purpose of it, which is protecting the natural environment of the chimps out there in the forest, is taken to, into account, then you realize the next um, progressive step is to involve ecotourism in the, in the picture. What ecotourism does, it adds another layer of conservation and it facilitates as an extra revenue channel as well. And the way we do it at Takugama is we sign an MOU with the communities, especially for the projects that's done outside in the communities. Mm -hmm. And we do it that way. For example, we're working with a, a new site in Pujeun. It's called the island of Jaibui. And we've signed an MOU in that area with 14 community, uh, community districts. Okay. So they're on board and they're supporting our cause there. For here, um, it's a different it's a bit different model. 
we do it uh, with six ecologists and we're trying to diversify the product offering with new events, new concepts, getting people to come and experience nature and also enjoy enjoy the beautiful scenery on Takugama. It truly is spectacular to be up here. What are some of the um, new offerings for people who visit Takugama? So we're always looking at various events. For example, now we're expanding into um, including meditation classes. Of course, we do yoga classes, yoga retreats, and that's very popular with our, with our crowd, and it's getting much more um, notice as well. Um, the other thing we're doing as well is uh, our founder, Bala, is uh, quite the culinary man himself, and we're trying to push more of the, the curry night and come up with new special dinners as well. Okay. Of course, we're also doing jazz nights. We had Jane Peters come up last week, and Jane Peters did a fantastic, fantastic performance. And, I mean, there's always activities surrounding the, uh, the sanctuary as well. For example, we have seven hiking trails, mm -hmm. and we also have a daily private tour for birds, mm -hmm. bird and walk tour. And we also do a monthly event at the end of the, each calendar month, and then people gather much more of a bigger crowd, and we do breakfast, and Willie, our resident tour guide, does a fantastic job there as well. Okay. How do you, because um, we stayed in the lodge, and I realized that you have, um, you have light, yep. and I know that, NPA is definitely, or EDSA is definitely not up here. Yeah. So how do you manage to get um, the power that you're using in the facilities? And also, how what kind of materials did, materials did you use to um, build the structures that people get to stay in? So as much as possible, the, the primordial, I mean, concern for us, whatever we're doing in terms of expansion, the number one concern is to minimize the environmental impact. Right and that takes into account the material that we use to build the ecologies and also some of the platforms around us. We want to keep it to minimal and sustainable use. In terms of the energy side of things, we're still running generator about eight hours a day mm -hmm. and for us to eventually fulfill our you know, eco footprint ch uh, concept and make it much more sustainable, we need to knock off the generator and uh, create some sort of mechanism that allows us to run on a much more clean energy facility process. Mm -hmm. Now for the time being, yes, we are running the eight-hour process with the generator, but we also have a solar panel system for at night as well. Uh, we have 23 solar panels and we have about 18 batteries that gives us a chance to power the echo lodges at night. Okay. And we're working on a project to put in place a system that's completely, like I said, eco-friendly but that, of course, is a huge challenge in terms of coming up with the funds to implement that. Mm -hmm. So that's my next uh, getting the funds in place <laughs> to, to implement that system. So. Okay, speaking of funds, how does um, Takugama actually get the resources it needs, the financial resources, to manage mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis? Mm -hmm. And to, I, mean, to, I mean, it's been around forever, so how does it keep going? Yeah. And then also, for those who might want to get involved, what are besides just visiting, what are some opportunities maybe for mm. businesses or individuals who are interested in ecotourism and preserving mm. ecotourism and um, promoting conservation in Sierra Leone? What are some of the things that they can basically participate in with um, Takugama? So, I mean, as we, as we talked about, the ecotourism is a considerable revenue channel for us. It's, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's one of the mainstreams that keeps us alive. Okay. But in terms of the challenges we face, we need to be creative sometimes. We need mm -hmm. to diver diversify those sources. Mm -hmm. And as part of my job is to detect um, not only institutions, organizations, zoos, which they all support us, mm -hmm. build relationships with them through grants, proposals. Uh, that's one way of doing And we've got traditional partners and longtime supporters. For example, I'll give you some, some notable. Um, Copenhagen Zoo is one of our biggest supporters. On the institutional side, we work with Arcus. Arcus has given us a considerable grant to, to go ahead and with some of the ecotourism projects as well. Okay. And of course, on the community side, we're trying to develop, um, we're trying also to develop an ecotourism program in Mobanda. And that'll be funded by UNDP, basically. So there's a huge portion there for us. Okay. Now, the creative side is to, again, go a notch above that. We want to become eventually fully sustainable. And one of the ways to do that is to, at least from my um, strategy point, mm -hmm. and it's very important to set up the routes as well, okay. to get the local um, companies on board, uh, sponsorships. Creating local support will sort of generate uh, not only uh, momentum within the country, getting people to recognize that some of these companies are not only here to implement business, mm -hmm. but also support the people in the communities. So if anybody in that corporate world is interested in reaching out to Takugama, 
we have different mechanisms. Okay. We have the bronze, silver, and gold, mm -hmm. and the contributions can, can be made either as a direct sponsorship mm -hmm. or contributed to a direct project, for example, whether it's education, conservation, mm -hmm. ecotourism, and I'll be happy to sit down with anybody to you know discuss that. Okay, what's the, if you were to take somebody, like, you know, I somebody's watching at home and, you know, they're like, okay, well, what's my experience going to be like at Takugama? What's the general visitor experience? Like, if you came and you stayed mm. here overnight or for the weekend, what are some of the things that they can hope to experience and do? The most, the most common reaction is, um, oh, wow, I, I just didn't really think this was possible in, right, in right, Sierra Leone. Right, right. Like, Takugama, wow, you guys are... Not only are you involved on the chimp side, but you've, you've developed all of this and now you're pushing the envelope in terms of, like I said, the jazz nights, getting people to come and experience nature. Mm -hmm. I could also share with you, for example, we're working on a new project mm -hmm. to bring local families up and connect them with mm -hmm. nature. So that's, that's really truly unique for the sanctuary, but mm -hmm. also for the development of kids and people to, to learn about uh, nature again. Mm -hmm. There's a huge disconnect there. Mm -hmm. And once they do learn about nature, they realize that protecting the forest is not always about protecting the natural habitat of the chimpanzees, but also humans are dependent on that. Mm -hmm. And if we can take better care of that land and the resources, then people could have better lives, better position to provide income for their families, mm -hmm. and that creates the greater good circle. So that's important for people to realize that. That's amazing. Well, you heard it here. We protect and conserve the environment, not just for the chimps, but also for the people. It's the Vicky Ramo Show, and we will be right back. We've just come to the end of our stay here at Takugama Chimp Sanctuary. We went on a bird walk, we learned how to make noises like birds, we saw the chimps, and we learned a little bit more about conservation. The bottom line is this. Conservation isn't just for the animals, it's also for us. So see you next time here on the Vicky Ramo Show.